What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and in today's Kerbal Space Program video we're going to be continuing with the little mini series I've got called Destination Duna in which we kind of you know do a full expedition to Duna's orbit and indeed Duna's surface in the form of various different missions. So what have we done previously? We've done an orbital space station with a functioning habitation gravity ring to prevent our cobbles from like experiencing bone loss or anything else that um, you know could be avoided by having a spinning gravity ring. We've also got a big surface base to perform lots of you know scientific analysis uh, research on how Kerbals can manage on extraplanetary destinations. I was going to say extraterrestrial, but then people might say that that's terrestrial refers specifically to Earth. So we're going to say extraplanetary. Is that what I said? I don't even remember. We've got a surface base regardless. And to complement that surface base, we have a gigantic research rover so that once we've exhausted all of the scientific analysis and other experiments that we can perform, in our immediate vicinity at the surface base, we can head out into the roving base into the great red unknown and perform lots more missions, analyses, and other, you know, uh, assorted antics across the surface of many Duna biomes is my plan. However, so far our expedition has been lacking one very crucial piece, and that is of course Kerbals to uh, go ahead and operate all of the said things that we've put in place, and that's what we're going to be doing in this episode. You can see we're building a space plane here. This is going to be the vehicle that will transport Kerbals to and from the surface of Juna, uh, as in in the surface base and rover, to the orbiting space station. I believe there is enough fuel in them as well to possibly get all the way back to Kerbin as well in an emergency situation. But off the top of my head, I can't actually remember how much this thing has uh, in terms of Delta V leftover once it reaches Juna orbit again after a surface mission. Um, we'll probably find out at some point <laughs> in this series, not in this video, but at some point I'll probably realise if we can or cannot get back to Kerbin in one tank, but I'm just saying it, that's not really the function of this space plane, it's just an emergency feature that we possibly have if we need it, which hopefully we won't. But I don't know what the coronavirus situation is like on Duna, we may need this in an emergency to get a Kerbal back to Kerbin in isolation. So at this point in the build, you can see I'm placing lots of RCS ports on this thing just to help not only give it lots of lateral control when it comes to maneuvering in space, because the docking port is on the top of the vessel, which means it's going to be very hard to dock to things without RCS ports. The second reason, uh, I'm going to show it here during one of my test flights. Space planes are very difficult to land on Duna because you need to be going quite slowly in order to safely touch down, but the slower you go on Duna, the more your craft wants to nosedive, just because the atmosphere is very, very thin. So it's very hard to land at safe speeds. However, by having monopropellant thrusters on the underside of the fuselage, we can make sure the nose stays level and that we can actually, you know, maintain level flight as we descend so that we don't nosedive too hard and explode upon impact. And as you can see as well, they really, really help when it comes to taking off also <laughs> because we can force the nose up and get ourselves airborne much sooner than we would be able to if we were just relying on building up horizontal speed, which is what you could do on somewhere like Kerbin. Again, you need to get lots of horizontal speed before the wings will start lifting the plane up without any other assistance. Monopropellant thrusters just help there. I often sometimes use Werner engines as well. Um, they serve a very similar function to the monopropellant thrusters. These days I never design Duna space planes or SS2s without some form of lateral control engine. Because, you know, it just makes things so much easier and so much safer for our Kerbins. Kerbins? for our Kerbals. That's not to say SSTOs and space planes aren't possible at all on Juna without monopropellant thrusters. I have built many Juna aircraft that can land without monopropellant or Werner engines, but these days I, I, I never do, and I never recommend going without them these days. So there's a little top tip for you if you're ever designing a space plane that's designed to land on Juna or anywhere else with a very thin atmosphere, which come to think of it is nowhere. You know, the other atmospheres you've got are Eve, which is obviously much thicker than Kerbin, so it's even easier to land on Eve than it is on Kerbin, and Lathe, which is thinner than Kerbin's atmosphere, but it is much more comparable, so you don't really need lateral control like you would on Juna. So that was kind of a redundant point just then about, you know, using this for other planets. Anyway, now you can see me attaching both of the planes because I wanted to take two to the, you know, <laughs> Duna orbiting station, I've attaching them to a mothership, which is currently under construction. So I've actually attached them via the junior docking ports that you can see there, and I've just offset them so that they're actually at a slightly better position. 
kind of a cheesy way, I know, it's sort of abuse of the offset tool, but they are still attached using struts and nothing is clipped together, so I feel like this is a quote-unquote acceptable form of cheating, again in air quotes, because I don't really consider it cheating, just possibly using the offset tool for things it wasn't really designed for. Doesn't matter anyway, we're moving on. Now you can see we're just constructing the rest of the mothership. I'm kind of going for an aesthetic-y look here. I believe Cupcake Landers used this to kind of design originally where he used a Mark 1 crew cabin to kind of make a little bridge on a uh, Mark 3 structural piece like I'm doing at the front of this ship. I'm also going to add a regular style command pod there just to serve as a kind of docking arm. That's what that Apollo style command pod is for there. So we can dock this thing to the space station. I did kind of make a bit of a boo-boo here. I did in I, I did add lots of docking ports to the stations so that it could be expanded. However, I, for the main section of the space station, which was mine, that's where I intended to dock this thing, uh, to get it in line with the rest of the station, which has a very long linear appearance, much like this ship. That docking port on the space station is a senior docking port, not a regular sized docking port, which is what this thing has. This thing's gonna have to be docked side on to the space station, so we're gonna have a bit of an a bit of an L shaped look <laughs> to the space station around you know. So it's, it's not ideal, but at least it all works. So that's I guess it wasn't too disastrous in the end. In terms of the transfer stage that will get us from low Kerman orbit to Juno, I'm just using a big 5-meter uh, Saturn V fuel tank from the Making History DLC with a Rhino engine. Not the most efficient setup by any stretch of the imagination, but it has good TWR, you know, compared to something like a nuclear engine or, God forbid, an ion engine, which are much more efficient options. It will take much, much less time in, to do our burns, which for the sake of a video and just for my enjoyment as a player of the game is a much better choice. At the end of the day, we're not going for efficiency here. We have a rocket with lots of stages. It doesn't really matter how much fuel we take because all we need to do is add more boosters and you can get it to orbit nice and easily. And for the boosters themselves, you can see we're using the massive Saturn V parts with, I believe that's five Mastodon engines. Uh, at the base, or at least there will be five in a second, uh, flanked by two stacks of uh, what was the biggest tanks in the game. Is it the Kerberdyne S? I've no idea what they are. But they used to be the biggest parts in the game before the Making History DLC came out. Again, with three Mastodon engines on the bottom. And then you may have noticed, guys, that this thing has quite a big payload, not very aerodynamic. So I'm adding these four gigantic space shuttle tail fins to the bottom of the main stack just to help keep this thing in stable flight. They're probably not essential because the Mastodon engines do have lots and lots of thrust vectoring. Uh, thrust vectoring is when the nozzle can actually steer the craft itself. I just wanted to be better safe than sorry, have a little bit of extra control just so we can definitely make sure that we stay under control. And with that, it is ready to launch this thing. So, unlike most of my launches where we start our gravity turn pretty much immediately, I'm going to start our gravity turn a little bit later on, just because, again, we've got lots of aerodynamic surfaces in the form of the uh, space planes at the top of the stack. It, 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 it's a very difficult to control rocket, is what I'm trying to say. So if we try and start our gravity turn too soon, whilst we're going through the thicker parts of the atmosphere, this thing will get very, very flip heavy. You can see actually how much those engine nozzles are uh, freaking out as I'm trying to keep this thing under control. So I'm just going to try and do as much of our gravity turn in thinner parts of the atmosphere as I possibly can. So we're going to try and get through the thickest part of the air first by going straight up and get out of the way nice and quick. And then we can start our gravity turn a little bit higher up where the air is a bit thinner than it is if we were going to do the gravity turn lower down. I hope that all made sense. I feel like I was getting a bit incoherent towards the end, but I feel like I got everything I wanted to get across uh, across. So it's all good. I think we can continue with our burn. We're going to still maintain a fairly aggressive angle of attack here, pointing pretty much 45 degrees, just because we're going to have to be doing our circularization using the Rhino engine, which has much, much lower thrust to weight ratio than our current five engine Mastodon stage. So it's going to take a long time to circularize. We're going to try and basically get as much space between us and Apoapsis as we can using the really powerful stage. And now that we've got a much lower thrust engine, we've got lots and lots of time to circularize before we risk going too far past our apoapsis and re-entering our and re-entering the atmosphere, where by which point we'll have, we won't have any enough time to complete our circularization burn before we just start feeling the effects of re-entry and uh, you know the air resistance 
very much obliterates any thrust that the Rhino engine can provide. If I really wanted to boost the TWR, I could fire up the nuclear engines on the space planes here. But the problem is the Rhino engine needs liquid fuel and oxidizer, whereas the space plane engines only need liquid fuel. So it's a little bit hard when it comes to getting the amount, right amount of fuel ratios in the craft. I thought it would be easier just to only use the Rhino engine. And from a realistic standpoint as well, probably we shouldn't be using the space plane engines at this stage. We want to keep them, you know, fresh and unused until we actually need them just to minimize the amount of stress on the reactors themselves. Uh, we don't want to get, leave Kerbals stranded on the surface of Juno. But hey, that's why we brought two space planes. There's only going to be six Kerbals going down to the surface of the red planet because there are only six seats on those space planes. And should one space plane crash upon impact or malfunction or any other disasters happen, we've got another space plane ready on standby to swoop down and help out. And I've just realized that I don't think there are probe cores on board the space planes, which means that uh, someone would have to pilot it down, which means we couldn't get all six Kerbals back. So that's a bit of an oof. Slight oversight on my part. Maybe we should only send five <laughs> maybe we should only send five Kerbals down to the surface of uh, Duna, come to think of it. But there are some Kerbals there. Oh, well there we go. I, I, I probably should have uh, held the camera on that shot a little bit longer than I did in order to actually show the footage properly. But regardless, it's not really relevant to the mission, so we can go ahead and actually do the stuff that is relevant to the mission, which right now is performing our Kerbin escape burn. And I'm using the uh, advanced burn indicator, I think that's what the option's called, that tells you when to start your burn, which is roughly at, you know, when the T minus reads half the estimated burn time, that's when you start the burn. It's not quite that, but that's a good rule of thumb. But now we have this feature in the game, you don't even have to worry about working out when to start the burn. It just tells you. It's a great quality of life feature. Um, but yeah, that, that's the burn done. That's why I love the Rhino engine for transfer stages. It uses a lot more fuel than its more efficient counterparts, but it's so much quicker. It's just so much easier, guys. <laughs> and we've got a pretty good Juno encounter. Obviously, I got a Juno encounter fairly easily because we launched at a Juno transfer window. For those that don't know, I know some of you are probably rolling your eyes because I say this every single video, but if you were to draw a line from Kerberton to the Sun to Duna, the angle that that line forms at the Sun would be about 45 degrees. That's how you know you're at a Duna transfer window. And I know I say that a lot, and people have mentioned I say that a lot, but I'm aware that some people, this could be their first video that they've seen of mine or just of any Kerbal video, and so they wouldn't know that. So I keep reiterating things like that. Although you shouldn't use this video as a tutorial. You know, this is... I don't want to say it's an advanced mission for advanced players such as myself, because that just sounds a bit cocky and arrogant. And really, it's not really a difficult mission. But if you are a beginner and you're trying to do your very first Juno mission, probably don't use this video as a guide. Use an actual tutorial. I myself have done quite a few. I would point you towards my Laun Aerospace series, more specifically Laun Aerospace, the second one, just because... I don't know, I kind of redid my tutorial series where I didn't use any DLC or anything, so it's a bit more accessible to new players. So that's there, you know, if you want to really... This is me now talking specifically about what we're doing in every single step of the mission to guide you through it. That's not what we're doing in this video, but I will talk about things a bit. So, I'm just going to create a new node to get ourselves circularized because air braking is for scrubs, and I quickly dropped the periapsis marker to intersect the space station's orbit so we can see how close the two objects are. Unfortunately, we're not going to get a very good encounter, which is kind of my hope, and then I could pretend I planned it all out and I was really good at the game. Alas, didn't quite work out that way. I had a look at the target indicator nodes, and I could see that the target was going to be slightly behind us, which means that we need to go into a slower orbit than the space station in order to give it enough time to catch up to us. And a slower orbit is a higher orbit. So we're going to keep our uh, orbit slightly above the space station in order to give it enough time to catch up with us. And then once we've allowed some time, we can then drop our periapsis down, and we should get a nice, easy encounter with the station. Yes, the encounter is going to be fairly easy. The docking, not so much. And we do, it's one of the the funnier moments I've had in Kerbal Space Program. So I hope you look forward to that. Uh, all we're doing is um, watching the burn. Hey, why not consider subscribing and ringing the bell? I um, feel like I should say that at some point in the video as a professional YouTuber. I don't know. Anyway, uh, now we can, now I've got something to talk about. I'm dropping the periapsis down here to see where our target indicator is. As you can see, the target's still going to be a bit behind us. 
and there wasn't really much I could do to change that. If I skipped to the next orbit, the target would have caught up with us and then overshot us and it'd be way ahead. So what I'm going to do is drop our orbit down so that our periapsis is at the same height as the space station, but leave our apoapsis as is. We'll then time warp around to our new periapsis and then drop our apoapsis down a little bit, not to the same level as the space station's height, just a little bit higher, so that our orbit is only slightly slower than the space stations. And that would allow enough time for it to catch up with us. And if we create another maneuver node in our new orbit, uh, we can easily get a nice close encounter. So I've kind of slowed our orbit down in stages in order to allow the space station to catch up to us in a good amount of time without too much faffing around on our part. I hope that makes sense. Hopefully the footage did the talking for me. Again, I'm, this isn't really a docking tutorial. If you, There are better videos out there that focus specifically on docking if you'd like it. I've just kind of done a quick summary and then you can hopefully learn by just watching. But the basic principles of getting rendezvous with objects is... Uh, if you're behind, if it's behind you, you want to enter a higher orbit so that you're going slower so that it can catch up. And if it's ahead of you, you want to enter an, uh, a lower orbit so that you can orbit faster and catch up to it. Obviously, if it's right on the border of an atmosphere, that's not possible. So in which case, you can either edit the target's orbit, or if that's not possible, like it is in this case, you can just enter a much, much slower orbit so that um, the target ends up catching back up to you in a few orbits time. You know, either patience, patience is the key. Patience is the key when it comes to the subject of rendezvous. So now you can all stop sending me direct messages on Discord and pinging me on Twitter, asking me how to dock. I get that a lot, you know. Like, people will send me a direct message on Discord just saying, you know, can you give me some tips on how to get better at KSP? And I'm like, what do I even say to that? I say for, like, people say it to me on Twitter as well. It's like, there are no, there's no just tip that I can give that will just make you a better player. Unfortunately, you just have to practice at KSP and you will just naturally get better. There are no tips. If you want some, if you want a good tip, watch some tutorials and play the game, and that's how you get better. So uh, I don't want to sound. I just feel like that might have sounded really rude just then. I wasn't trying to sound rude or anything, but it is a bit frustrating when people just send messages saying, "Can you send me some tips?" And it's like I leave my direct messages open on Discord so that people can report server problems or things like that. Um, most of my messages end up getting buried because I just get so many messages of just, "Can you?" Can you give me a shout out? Can you join my Discord are the two main ones? Um, which, by the way, is a no. <laughs> uh, but after that, it's just, can you give me general tips? And it's like, I can't. I can't. I've got too many <laughs> requests like this and tips. There's no, that you can't, for anything, there is no just general tip that you can give to get better. Everything in life, unfortunately, is hard work and practice. And here is the sp <laughs> kind of an almost philosophical tangent just then. Here we are approaching the space station. Now, the main ship here does not have monopropellant, so we're going to try and get as close as possible to the target by using the Rhino engine, burning prograde and retrograde relative to the target. Now that we're somewhat close, we can start getting the space planes into their docked positions on the space station. We don't really need them docked, I suppose, but I kind of want it to look cool so that Kerbals can get ready for their surface mission on board the space station, then easily transfer via IVA, not EVA, uh, into the crafts nice and safely. It just looks and it just looks cooler, you know, seeing space planes docked to a space station in this way. Uh, we're going to dock them towards the end of the craft. You can see I've already selected the docking port as our target. We can open up the shield on the Mark II inline cockpit and then just use the RCS thrusters to do the rest of the work. Now, I didn't use any of the RCS, like, four-way blocks. I just used the individual ones just because they're a little bit more... Uh, they look cosmetically look a lot better. I think they cause a lot less drag as well. Um, and that's it. They look a lot better, actually. They look a lot better is actually the main reason why I use these ones rather than the four-way RCS blocks. But, yeah, not too bad. Pretty easy dock. Um... Like I said, the main difficulty came when it, <laughs> the main difficulty when docking was when I was trying to dock the giant mothership to the space station. Not because it was uh, actually I don't know what I was going to say because <laughs> it was it was just difficult because it was so big. It has no RCS blocks and it's very very long. Like so, it's very hard to get it perpendicular to the docking port. In fact, I couldn't get it perpendicular to the docking port. It was always off at an angle. But I hope you guys like the solution I came up with to get around this issue. Uh, but before we get too far into spoilers, we're going to undock the second space plane and get that docked to the space station, which uh, we do a bit of cheating and get the space station rotated to uh, have the docking port at a slightly easier position to facilitate our docking. And 
Well, then we can we can just do it, I suppose. So we can just you guys could just watch me do that now. So I'm going to get nice and close using the nuclear engines, and then we can slow down using RCS. We don't have to worry about wasting monopropellant too much. Obviously, we want as much monopropellant on board these things as possible, so that when we do our Duna landing and indeed our Duna ascents, we have a full tank of monopropellant to uh, help us out with the flight. We can just refuel them though using the space station. You see, one of the primary functions of the space station was to refuel vessels, so we can use that by restocking the monopropellant supply of the space planes. They can deorbit themselves using those uh, external tanks that I've got on the underside of the space planes and then we can just detach the tanks once we've entered Duna's atmosphere and they're not going to be, we're not going to risk leaving them stuck in orbit, cluttering up space and endangering the space turtles. There we are. What a shot. So we've got both of the space planes attached. Now comes the, uh, the tricky part of the mission, attaching this long boy to the station. So the first thing I'm going to do is get nice and far away and just trying to eyeball it so that we're kind of perpendicular to the space station. Obviously I've got to imagine what it would be like if we were facing forwards. Obviously we're sideways on at the moment. We need to be facing directly towards the space station because this thing will be docking to a side mounted port much like the space planes because again the linear ports, the ones that are in line with the length of the space station are all senior size which I probably admittedly should have checked, or let's face it, I probably should have just remembered that. It wasn't that long ago since I assembled this space station, but regardless, we live and learn, don't we? So we're going to have to try and dock it to a side once. So here we go. We got it roughly what I think was a little bit per was, was perpendicular. I feel like they are aligned. Now we can just coast towards the docking port very, very, very slowly to make sure we're actually getting it lined up. So I'm just holding down the target indicator on the nav ball. Maybe, maybe. I mean, they're touching, they're kissing, but they're not quite docking. And that's because if I zoom out, this thing is at an angle. You know, the back end is tipped way far out and there's no monopropellant thrusters at the back. We've only got the ones at the front on the sides of the command pod. But then I had an idea. If we just use a Kerbal to smash into the side of the back of the ship, we might be able to change it. So we're going to try and do that. We're going to smash a Kerbal into the side of the ship, try and give some vectoring there. And it worked! <laughs> I was like, this problem, this is so dumb, it might just work. And hey, it did. And I was just turning the lights off and on there to make sure the vessels were indeed docked together. And uh, they did. So thank you, our brave Kerbal. I can't even read your name because the screen is so blurry on the Vegas preview. What does that say? Harla Kerman? Harla Kerman? Let's call him Hurler Kerman. Harla Hurler. The Harla the Hurler Kerman. There's a tongue twist to try and say that five times fast. Harla the Hurler Kerman. Saved the day with his head <laughs> smashing into the side of the rocket, which I'm sure is a maneuver that NASA themselves would turn to in a situation like this. Anyway, that's pretty much the bulk of this mission done. Next week, or I don't know if it's going to be next week, but at some point in the future, we're going to be doing a surface excursion. We're going to land the space planes, get the Kerbals on board the space station, on the surface, I mean, the surface station and the rover. Here's a little shot inside the gravity ring, by the way. Uh, and we'll do all of the other stuff. So that's what you got to look forward to, guys. One criticism people might have of this thing. I'm going to cut away to a external shot of the space station. The refueling bays, as you can see, are liquid fuel and oxidizer. Because at the time, I didn't realize I'd be going with liquid fuel only solutions for the uh, surface ascension modules, which are obviously the two nuclear space planes. So maybe I should add an extension to this station at some point, which is just a giant liquid fuel reserve. Not sure yet. We'll think about it at some, at some point in the future. For now, our Kerbals can get used to their new homes and get ready, of course, to uh, head off down to the surface of the Red Planet. But I'm going to leave it there with some links on screen. On the left-hand side is a link to the full uh, Destination Juno playlist. On the right-hand side was one video that was just chosen for you by YouTube's suggestion algorithm bots. There's also a link to subscribe and check out Patreon if you would like to do either of those things. And in the description, you'll find links to Twitter, Instagram, Discord, Patreon, all that good stuff. Guys, thank you so much for watching my video. I hope you have an excellent day.